Dear participants, welcome to the 10th lecture of the East Aegean and Anatolia lecture series of ARVA for 2022. Um, I'm Chidam Atakuman, who is the host of this year's uh, lecture series. Um, today, we welcome an outstanding scholar, Professor Marcella Frangipane from Sapienza University at Rome who will be speaking on the topic of Eastern Anatolia as the piece of many encounters, different interacting complex societies in the Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age from fifth to third millennium BCE. Marcella Frangipani is full professor of prehistory and protohistory at the Sapienza University of Rome, where she thought Prehistory and proto history of the Near, Near and Middle East and strategies and methods of archaeological research till 2018. Professor Frangipani has conducted field research in Mexico, Italy, Egypt, and Turkey, becoming field vice director of the Sapienza excavations at Mahdi in Egypt. Since 1976, she has been member of the staff of the Italian archaeological expedition in Eastern Anatolia of the Sapienza University of Rome and becoming the director of the project in 1990. In this context, she has led the excavations at Aslantepe Malatya for more than 30 years till 2019, also leading the salvage excavations at Zeytinli Bahçe in Urfa in Turkey. The Aslantepe project has been the core of her research activity and interests, which focus on the rise of the first hierarchical societies, the origin and development of early centralized economies, bureaucracy, urbanization, and the state in the ancient Near East, with particular focus on Mesopotamia and Anatolia. And thanks to her efforts and commitment in close collaboration with the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of Turkey, the local Malati authorities, the local population, and her team, Aslantepe has been inscribed in the list of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites list in July 2021. Professor Frangipani is the author of 180 publications, among which she authored or co-authored four books. She has also been the editor-in-chief of the journal Origini, and the editor of the series Study the Prehistory Orientale of Sapienza University of Rome. She is currently still the editor of the monograph series Aslantepe, where the final results of the excavations at the site, site are published. She has received several awards for her research activity Aslantepe, among which we may count the Discovery Award by the Shanghai Archaeology Forum, the Victoria de Sica Prize for Science, and the Rotondi Prize to Art Saviors. She has also received the honorary PhD by the University of Malatya in Turkey and the title of uh, Cavaliera della Repubblica by the President of Italian Republic. Professor Frangipane is member of the Academia Nazionale di Lincey in Italy, forum member of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, and forum fellow of the British Academy, uh, and member of the Deutsches Archaeological Institute in Berlin and the Archaeological Institute of America. So we are uh, extremely uh, happy to have her today with us. And it's our honor to host her, uh, this outstanding scholar, um, uh, who will be sharing her results and thoughts on the state formation and different interacting complex societies in East Anatolia. Thank you very much for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. everything, everything is perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here and uh, to, to speak about such uh, shared topics and question with many colleagues. So um, first of all, so I, I will start in, in order to, sorry. Um, 
first of all, I want to say that, uh, of course, the concept of Eastern Anatolia may appear as a kind of strange unity because it's not a unity. It's a, it, there are a lot of different regions with different histories and different uh, pathways. But at the same time, I think the, the term is um, uh, understandable because, because uh, as in the case of the Near East, it's the same. So uh, why we call Near East? So it, it, there are a lot of different regions, but um, the connection between the regions that are part of this, of this uh, general uh, cultural unit is uh, are more closer than with the other regions outside this area. And the same is for Eastern Anatolia. What I will try to, to show um, very briefly, of course, in a very, very, very running among, uh, across millennia is um, why uh, this, why we can call, we can speak about Eastern Anatolia or Southeastern Anatolia. So which, is, which are the foundation of this cultural uh, unit, of course, uh, in the sense I have just explained it. So um, for this reason, I will start from the beginning. Uh, um, I will start with the, with the early period, so from the late Neolithic, because in, in, the, in those regions, we have in those area, sorry, periods, we have the roots of what we can see later. And um, so this is just a very schematic uh, picture of the many different uh, cultural areas in, in the Neolithic and early Calcolithic and also in later periods, but uh, that at the same time, they compose a kind, I can say, of unit. So uh, the, the great change we are going to, to show in this, uh, in this lecture are uh, two main uh, transitional periods. Well, three, in fact. One is in the fifth millennium BC when the egalitarian Halaf society that covered all great part, large part of the Eastern Anatolian regions um, underwent a big change in the encounter with Ubaid, Southern Mesopotamian Ubaid culture. So there is a big, deep change, also structural and organizational change in this society that thanks to the presence of the Halaf homogeneous culture, this change was spread all over this region. And the second is the what happened in the fourth millennium BC, when uh, Southeastern Anatolia particularly was uh, affected by the phenomenon of the so-called Uruk expansion. And we, we try to see or to uh, reflect on what we mean when we say Uruk expansion. So, um, and then we will, in the last part of the lecture, we'll go on with the, another big change that is at the, uh, in the transition between the fourth and third millennium BC. So the, the first point is uh, what, what was this Alafu Bay transition? Uh, this was a case, very, very interesting case, in my opinion, of integration and the hybridization of different societies, very different in terms of organizational um, pattern, in terms of economy, in terms of political organization and so on, that um, hybridizing produced a new hybrid culture. So uh, this is just to, to, to give an idea to people who maybe are not familiar with Eastern Anatolia. Um, the uh, Southeastern Anatolia was an, an larger area uh, also in the mountains uh, were affected by this, um, this kind of homogenization we had with the Alaf culture that uh, this culture was uh, a kind of, uh, we can say community-based societies in the sense that community, so the, the, the communities are more important in the general management of all the activities, economic activities, political um, organization and so on, 
uh, than the uh, individual families, in my opinion. This is, of course, an interpretation because according to the, uh, to the settlement pattern and to the way these society were organized and to another important point that is they have uh, collective storehouses where they put their, their um, harvest or their storage um, together without any elite or any real uh, uh, hierarchical um, differentiation. So this society, these groups um, practice a different economic activity, subsistence activity, agriculture, hunting, uh, pastoralism, uh, and they, they also their uh, iconography in the, in the pottery, for example, in the painting, uh, show this kind of community um, uh, feeling. Uh, the, the pottery is very, very well um, decorated. Uh, it's a kind of uh, specialized pottery, but not specialized by, by categories of specialized artisans, but probably was uh, done inside the different groups and families. But most of all, this was, a, in my opinion, again, is a kind of uh, identity expression. So these motifs had a social mean meaning. And the, 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 this culture spread all over the southeastern Anatolia, but also uh, toward the, the Zagros and the central Mesopotamia. It was in the beginning of fifth millennium or end of fourth that the impact from the obeyed culture that um, was expressed and, and reflected in many changes in, in the Halaf sites or earlier Halaf sites, um, that we, we see this change that I spoke about in, at the beginning. So uh, these were very different societies. So the Ubaid societies was, in my opinion, hierarchical from the beginning of the occupation of the alluvial plain in lower Mesopotamia. Uh, they were based on large families. Um, so the, the, the kind of organization was completely different from the Alaf communities. Uh, but what we see in some uh, northern sites that had uh, an Alaf sequence uh, is the change towards this new kind of society. So they are for one ex typical example is Tepe Gaura in the in the in northern Mesopotamia. So um, where we have the adoption of the typical houses, tripartite, so-called tripartite houses of lower Mesopotamia in a context that is completely different. And and in my opinion, when you have when you find houses, so this means probably people because the house is not something that can be emulated. The houses reflect the needs of a family, the needs of uh, domestic life. So I think that small groups of people were moving for some reason to the north and interacted with the Halaf community with which they already had relations before. And but this was a very interesting phenomenon uh, phenomenon of change of the structure of society. So they adopted also the temple um, uh, architecture from South Mesopotamia with some local change, of course. They adopted the, or emulated the uh, Ubaid painted pottery that substituted the Halaf pottery. Uh, but they also introduced new things that belong to the northern communities. And one of these things was the use of ceilings, of credule, seal and ceilings. Uh, that were, uh, was this system of controlling the, the movement of goods started in the uh, collective storehouse uh, of the Neolithic period. And uh, it was translated and transferred to the uh, new organization of society where uh, some probably big families or important families used this tool that was already experimented in the previous period to, um, to uh, interact with the, with the people, um, maybe uh, less privileged people. Because in this case, it's not the, the, the um, procedure 
for uh, guarantee the egalitarian distribution of goods, but it's something different. It's something that some families use this tool to uh, uh, accumulate resources and labor for perhaps labor from some people distributing food in exchange. So it, it's, a, it's a, a new use of the same tool. This uh, affected uh, immediately also Eastern Anatolia. We have the case of the Irmentepe in, in the Malatya Plain. That is a very, very interesting and typical example of this change where we have tripartite houses of the Mesopotamian type, but with an arrangement of the settlement that is local is the uh, uh, so-called agglutinated pattern typical of Anatolian societies. So again, the hybrid culture that emerged from this, and, and also the, um, in their Mentepe, there is a widespread use of ceilings, and uh, uh, these seal and ceilings were mainly concentrated in the, in the larger houses, not only, but mainly. And uh, uh, another point is the introduction in this period, so end of obeyed period, um, of the so-called mass-produced bowls. Uh, in this case, where the so-called Joba bowls from the Joba site in, in, in Anatolia, in southeastern Anatolia, where these bowls have been uh, described and, and classified for the first time. Uh, but these were um, a very widespread production that continued in, in the following period in a bigger scale, because this um, production was aimed at distributing food to large number of people um, in a way that was, uh, we can say, a quick way, probably distribution of meals, I think. Um, so what we see from the end of a bait period is something that link closely the southeastern Anatolian regions to the northern Mesopotamia and to southern Mesopotamia indirectly. So uh, it's the foundation of what we call greater Mesopotamia. So the Mesopotamia um, extended to the peripheries, also to the mountain peripheries of uh, Tauros Mountains and Zagros Mountains. So what happened? Why, why this uh, homogenization of this of this uh, different societies into one new type of society? Uh, I don't think it is an emulation because they were completely different society, and there is no reason that one or, or the leader of Alaf had to emulate the leader of Beit. And it is not trade. This is clear because even the pottery um, was all always locally made. When they made analysis, uh, pottery analysis, there is not no indication of uh, real trade as a reason for doing this. So probably some group of people from lower Mesopotamia uh, had some needs to move. We don't know why. This is a problem that must be studied more. And arriving in the north, they interacted with very different societies, the Alaf societies, that probably were undergoing a structural crisis because of the of the demographic uh, demographic reason. So uh, we have indication of a expansion, continuous expansion in the number of Alaf sites. And in the in the occupied region of the Alaf sites that became bigger and bigger, and so probably this uh, kind of egalitarian organization was not uh, the most suitable suitable one to face with the problem of of the complexity. So uh, probably the uh, contact with the obeyed people organized hierarchically and in a different way um, gave new um, input to a change toward a more organized, more hierarchical society. So what, what we have is a real hybrid multicultural society. So uh, on this basis, uh, this uh, continuous interaction with Mesopotamia in the, uh, in the 
fourth millennium BC also continued. But probably um, the reasons for this interaction changed. Um, I think they were more political reasons, um, of course, cultural in, in continuing, continued the cultural interaction, but also economic interaction and emulation in this case, because uh, the leaders of the Northern societies probably on the basis of the already shared cultural background with the Southern society, um, and the similarity in their socio-political structure emulated many aspects of the, of the Southern um, culture and society. Uh, again, what we have in this period are connection with, with the, the, the whole Mesopotamian world, but uh, in the late Chalcolithic, the first half of the fourth millennium, what we see in Anatolia, in Eastern Anatolia and Southeastern Anatolia is the differentiation, cultural differentiation, and also probably poly organizational differentiation from different sub-regions. Uh, one was the, the, the regions that were part of the so-called Upper Mesopotamia. So the, the hill flanks of the, um, of the Taurus mountain the, um, and the, the plain of the Jazeera, the northern part of the Jazeera, uh, that created a unity uh, with the Upper Mesopotamia. The other was the um, Upper Tigris Valley where we have uh, some different features that are found from Tepegaura up to uh, Norshun Tepe in the, in the Altinova. So we have a, a, a corridor, we can say, along the Tigris Valley with some specific uh, their own uh, cultural features, and then the Euphrates Valley. So middle and upper Euphrates Valley, that is again a little bit different from from the um, the rest of the of the region, uh, but anyway, they were part of this of this greater Mesopotamia uh, development, and they shared all together. They shared with the other regions, uh, sub regions in the north, similar consuming customs. For example, we have the typical casserole, what you see you see on your uh, right side. So big, big pot, uh, probably used as a cooking pot also, but used also for eating together in group. Um, this, the spreading, as I, I told before, of mass-produced bowls that spread everywhere in all these regions, North and South Mesopotamia, because of the needs that um, uh, requested, required this kind of production. Uh, with uh, technological uh, development of different type in different subregions, so uh, and also some in part partly mixed together. So we have pot, uh, bowls made on the slow wheel. We have bowls made uh, mm, by hand, and then uh, so called flint scraped. And we have also the beginning of the fast wheel at the end of this period. And of course, the so-called bevel rim bowls that are a typical southern Mesopotamian product that spread also in the north, not, not everywhere, but in many sites. So again, what we have in this period, so what we call late Calcolytic 3 and 4, but mainly late Calcolytic 4, is a different uh, in the uh, still continuing different in the subregions. So we have the first appearance of the first so-called colonies, Uruk colonies, that are concentrated on the Euphrates Valley, middle Euphrates Valley, not in the upper Euphrates, and uh, perhaps in the Habur, in Telbrak, we have evidence of a, of a kind of impact of middle Uruk culture uh, in the local settlement. So there are again, group of people moving and settling in this region, but uh, the only real uh, colony in the sense that is a new settlement, a new foundation, completely new foundation by an entire community are very, very rare. 
And uh, I think they are only present in the Syrian Middle Euphrates. So the on, in my opinion, the only real colonies in this sense are Sheikh Hassan in the middle um, Uruk, and then in late Uruk, Abu Bagabir and Jebel Arouda. The other sites are just uh, local sites where some people came, where there are, again, this kind of interaction that introduced uh, new changes. And uh, in the, uh, still in the Middle Uruk period, uh, Middle Euphrates and Upper Euphrates are different uh, cultural um, areas. In the sense that the sites on the, um, on the Upper Euphrates, for example, Atlantepe certainly, um, partly also Tepejik in this, in this phase, um, uh, and Ayas and other sites on the right bank of the Euphrates were more linked to the western part of the of the region. So they are linked to the Hamuk, they are linked to other sites uh, to the west of the Euphrates. So in this period, in some way, the Euphrates was not a connection, but a kind of border between what we have on the west and what we have on the east. So the Anatolian sites on, uh, that were on the uh, eastern bank of the Euphrates are closely linked to the rest of the Jazeera and the, of Upper Mesopotamia, and the other side, no. So this is just to show you one of the case of the colony that is Sheikh Hassan in the, in the Middle Uruk, and uh, the effect of this impact in different sites that are not colonies in the same sense. They are local sites where, where some people or some, we don't know exactly which kind of impact took place. Uh, Tel Brak, uh, they are just small, a few examples here. Of course, there are many others, uh, but the most typical are Ajinebi, Zaytin Libace, where we, uh, I excavated some years ago, uh, where we have a clear change. So there is a, a, a abrupt change in connection with the middle Uruk, not the late Uruk, the middle Uruk period. Um, we, we have a change in pottery, a change in the organization. And what is interesting is that these sites are all connected each other, but at the same time, they are connected also because of uh, some local traits that does not do not belong to the to the southern um, tradition, and one of these is the typical so-called idol that have been found in large number in Tel Brak, but also in Ajinebi, and one example also in Zaytin Libakche. This is a, a typical ex local northern expression that um, that anyway uh, put together all these northern sites. In the Upper Euphrates, the situation is different. Uh, the case uh, most, most uh, wide, uh, widely studied is Atlantepe, where we have um, clear local culture, but a development going in the same direction. So the, um, the beginning and the, the developing of uh, hierarchies, local hierarchies, we have in the site buildings, that um, are very large residential buildings, probably belonging to the elite, that were on the top of the mound and were very different from the normal houses that have been excavated in the periphery of the site. So there is a separation of an elite area from the rest of the settlement. But with local architecture, what is interesting is that at the end of this period, we have in Atlantepe, two uh, temples, one uh, very uh, badly preserved, um, uh, that, uh, that show a tripartite model, tripartite plan of architecture that is completely unusual in Atlantepe. We don't have tripartite houses. We don't have this kind of model in any other building except in this building that is a very large, probably temple, so it's certainly a ceremonial building with a kind of altar in the middle, and a lot, hundreds and thousands, we can say, of mass-produced bowls, um, and uh, hundreds of clay ceilings again. 
So redistribution of food was practiced in a ceremonial context as in Mesopotamia. But the, the material culture is local, is completely local. So the production of bowls, the ceilings and the, the seal designs are only uh, northern. Um, again, some elements that remind at least the so-called idol and the pottery. The pottery is amukef. So the pottery is a, has nothing to do with what we have in the Jazeera in the same time, at the same time, except for the technical uh, manufacture uh, features. So this, as in, in the whole region, this is a, made very fastly uh, as a rough and chaff tempered pottery everywhere, but the shape and the surface treatment and the taste is local and belong to this western area of the uh, southeastern Anatolia and the Amuk. Also the painting we found in the wall uh, and decoration in the wall of this temple uh, belong to a completely different tradition that is local again, is northern. Uh, from the Neolithic, we have example, and in the Mentepe, we have example of, of wall paintings. <clears throat> and finally, one of the most interesting uh, feature is the appearance at the end of this period, so at the end of the late Calcolithic four. so when in, the, in southern Mesopotamia we have the, the Middle Uruk colonies or Middle Uruk uh, connections, uh, in Aslan Tepe, we have the appearance of a, a new type of pottery in a very small quantity in this period. That is the so-called red-black pottery uh, for the technique that has um, is a special uh, firing technique that produce two different color, um, colored surface, one black and one reddish. Um, and the shape and the type of pattern of red-black is absolutely central Anatolia. And this kind of um, pottery we, will be found later in the palace period, so in the late Calcolithic five, so in the late Uruk corresponding to the late Uruk period, both in Atlantepe and in Tepejik. And so this showed that this site in the upper Euphrates have connections not only with Mesopotamia, they are not completely part of the Mesopotamian world, they have strong connection, but they are also interested in relate, relating with Anatolian regions, and in this case, particularly central Anatolian regions. Uh, there are close affinities with Alishariuk, late Calcolitic, Alajauk, late Calcolitic, so it's absolutely the connection uh, with the northwest. So again, uh, this area that in the late Turuk uh, is more consolidated um, cultural unit um, uh, include the upper Euphrates now, uh, but um, the relationship are very different from region to region. So um, probably you know that many scholars have uh, have um, proposed a model of a trade uh, uh, relationship, so the so-called um, world system theory, in which was trade the main reason to settle in the north. But I don't believe in this, in fact, in this period. I think, of course, when these people were living in, in, the, in this region, they were trading also, this is obvious, but they, this was not the pre prevalent pre prevailing reason uh, because the archaeological data does not demonstrate this. There is no concentration of raw material, no concentration of workshop, no concentration. And the, uh, for example, the metal that is one of the most um, used um, uh, element material to, to speak about, about trade, uh, as, as a composition that is uh, found in the whole Middle and Upper Euphrates region, but not in, in the South. So uh, it's not the same metal going to the South. 
So uh, as I told you before, other colonies are in the middle Euphrates, Jebel Arud and Abu Bakabira, but the other side, so Asek, Samsat, um, and, and probably other sites along the Euphrates River were affected by this impact, but they were not colonies in the proper sense. The most interesting and studied uh, site is Asekuyuk, because Asek has an architecture that uh, closely resembles and uh, the the the, the, uh, the uh, domestic architecture of the two colonies, Abu Bagabir and Jebel Aruda. But at the same time, it's a very small site. It's surrounded by wall as the other uh, colonies, but uh, is settled in a local in a local uh, settlement. And moreover, the study of the pottery that has been done uh, on this site by Barbara Elving and others and other scholars show clearly that the pottery is not totally Uruk pottery, as in the Jebel Arud and Abu Bakabira. So it's a, an elaboration of the, the Uruk material. So again, Aznantepe is, is the most um, different um, center. So Aznantepe became in this period, so end of fourth millennium, a real um, powerful center. Uh, I call it a, a state, an early state uh, society, because there are a very sophisticated, centralized uh, political and economic system, as in Mesopotamia, uh, but with uh, with their own local elaboration. So uh, they have storage, for example, the form of central storage, but the vessels and the type of storage is completely different from the south. Uh, they have, of course, the um, redistribution of food. So again, hundreds of uh, bowls. So now all of them are made on the first wheel. And also the glyptics and the um, administrative material is different because, uh, of course, uh, the system is similar because it, it came from the same development, the same kind of development the same kind of society and the uh, centralized uh, so, uh, society. But um, we don't have almost, well, we have, but very, very few uh, um, number of um, cylinder seals in comparison with the stamp seals that are much, much more numerous. Uh, styles are completely different from the Southern Mesopotamia. These are some examples of the different styles we have in Aznantepe that Holly Pittman has also shown that uh, it's a unique site in this respect because of the difference, very, very deep differences in style or um, and in style besides in su subjects. So the subjects are mainly animals of different type, but the style is completely different from one group to another. So this means that the different groups of people probably um, frequented the palace and used their seal in the economic transaction there. So it's not a homogeneous society. And also the, from a, the point of view of, uh, of iconography of power, we can say uh, there are big differences between uh, Southern Mesopotamia and um, Northern Mesopotamia and Atlantepe, most of all. So in Southern Mesopotamia, we have repeated uh, the, the, um, the element of the temple, the so-called so uh, king priest in front of the temple, people bringing offering to the temple, so all uh, rotate around the temple. Uh, in Atlantepe, nothing of this, no, no representation of any temple. But <clears throat> when the human figure are present, they are mainly related to agricultural activity. Even the famous uh, seal uh, of the um, leader on the sledge car is related to agriculture because this sledge car is has been considered a kind of tribulum for threshing, and uh, uh, the, the leader is followed by a procession of people with the forks. So it, it's all linked to agricultural activity as the most important uh, sphere of uh, action of the power, of the central power. 
And uh, the most, the biggest uh, difference is in the architecture, in the, in the architecture of the public places and public spaces. So we have, as you know, in Mesopotamia, it's mainly uh, still uh, temple architecture. Uh, even in Uruk, where the Eanna area is so big that it's six hectares, um, but they are big buildings, but separated, isolated one from the other, and they are mainly tripartite, and they are mainly temple uh, in the temple according to the temple model uh, standard. In Advantepe, it's a completely different pattern of a public area. So we have, uh, this is why I call it um, uh, the first example we know of a palace because uh, the buildings are agglutinated into one single complex. Uh, there are many different buildings with different functions, all linked together uh, in a complex that is exactly uh, similar, if not identical, because from a formal point of view is not the same plan as the palace of the third millennium BC. So we have temples, but the temples are small and are uh, only um, destined, intended for a few people, probably the elite people itself. So the place where people, people goes are not the temples, but are the storerooms uh, where they go to, to take food and to make their economic transactions. Um, and on the back side of this public area, we have the elite residences, as in the previous period, in the same area as in the previous period, that are linked to the public area. Uh, there are also doors connecting the residences with the public, uh, one of the public buildings. So it's like a palace with residential area and public area, economic area, administrative area, religious area, and so on. Uh, the most uh, interesting building found in the last um, decade is the so-called uh, audience building, um, because this is a very special building. It's, uh, well, um, first of all, these buildings are all bipartite, not tripartite. But anyway, the, the building is very impressively monumental because the walls are one meter, 80 centimeter thick, almost two meter thick. So this means that the building should have been very high. And we have proof that there was a second floor, a second story, uh, but um, it is organized in this way. So people, people, normal people do not enter the building as it was in the temple before. They remain outside in a courtyard and they were probably received by a person in authority who received them in this platform that you see marked with the yellow um, sign. Um, and there are two small uh, platform basement, very low, uh, where probably, I don't know, but it's just an interpretation where the, the standing point for people who, who goes to be received. They don't have to, crop, to go beyond this, uh, this line, this point. So uh, the platform, we have called it the throne platform because it is very similar to, uh, to um, uh, uh, in, in another um, platform of this type with, with the three steps also in, uh, in, in later period in the Mari Palace. Um, that is called the throne room, um, but also because we found on this on this platform wood material that is a um, very um, high quality wood, juniper wood, and they were uh, small in size, so they were not they were not beams collapsed from the roof, but they were probably a furniture and probably a seat something where uh, this, pe this person was sitting, receiving people. The temple, as I told you, is they are small and they are uh, reserved, intended only for a few people. They, the people remain outside and look at the ceremonies from the windows while the activity was made in the, 
in the storehouse, in the storehouse and this, in the storeroom. Again, the pottery is very interesting because we have a very few Uruk-like vessels, but very few. We have altogether five or six vessels in, in total. Um, but the majority are uh, Uruk influenced. So we have their servant slip decoration, the, they are well made, they are light colored. And interestingly, they also made this uh, so called fruit stands, these high stemmed bowls in this uh, light colored uh, pottery that is in, in some way an imitation of the um, Central Anatolian high stemmed bowl. Uh, found in uh, uh, red black ware. And red black ware in this period is even uh, more widespread than before. In, in the Atlante Pe Palace, uh, it is about 10, 15% of the, of the total repertoire. So it's quite a number of um, vessels, not only a rarity. Uh, so uh, the connection with Central Anatolia and who, who were the people? So were people from Central Anatolia? I don't think so. I don't think so, because uh, the position of Atlantepe is a, uh, you see, a position that is a kind of geographical and cultural border between the different um, societies and different cultures, Northeastern, Caucasian cultures, of course, Mesopotamia and Central Anatolia, with which Atlantepe had relationship. And, um, the peculiarity is also that Atlantepe has no um, real urbanization phenomenon. It's, a, it's a, a powerful center, but small. So it's like a castle, like a, a, a public place where um, while people uh, were even less than in the previous period. So the majority of people probably lived around the site in the plain. So the an important aspect is metallurgy, because metallurgy is an indication of the contact, contacts and relationship with these different groups moving around, I think, in the mountains of Eastern and Northeastern Anatolia and Central, North Central Anatolia. So um, probably they were uh, pastoralist, pe pastoralist people moving in the mountains and uh, in acting at least economically with the um, palace. So they were part of the system for a while, bringing metal, bringing uh, milk, bringing uh, perhaps wool, uh, who knows. But anyway, they were interested in going to the upper Euphrates Valley. And, and in the same period, we have the, uh, um, the so-called Uruk um, area, in the Tepejik settlement. So all the upper Euphrates is involved in this uh, kind of mediation between the Uruk world on one side and the people of the mountains, Anatolian mountains on the other. Uh, the metals in Atlantepe are very rich in different, uh, they have, they use a alloy of different type, they use a polymetallic um, uh, mineral, uh, silver, gold, lead, and so on. And of course, the famous uh, weapons that we have been found in the palace. So what we uh, think is that in green, you see the area that are rich in mineral ores, in copper ores, and, uh, and the arsenic. So the red is arsenic. So um, I think that these people moving in the mountains crossed the also east-west from north central Anatolia to east northeastern Anatolia. So they they were the contact um, for the upper Euphrates people. So I don't think that people from central Anatolia settled in Aslantepe, but they they um, they were so these pastoralist people moving and interacting with Aslantepe were uh, the, um, the connection with all these regions. And in fact, what we have in the palace period is an increase, a huge increase in sheep and goat, and particularly sheep in the animal breeding pattern that, um, that again uh, reflect a, a kind of specialization in pastoralism 
probably due to the connection with these uh, specialized pastoralist groups moving in the area around. So the hypothesized movement I put in this map is this one. So east-west, but also from both sides toward the upper Euphrates, because the upper Euphrates was the most desired destination of these people because uh, the upper the Euphrates Valley uh, was a, a kind of opening towards the south and towards other center in the in the middle Euphrates for example so um, this pastoral community um, uh, cr created, uh, so the relationship with this pastoral community was another model again, with respect to the two previous models I, I show you. So they were dominated probably politically because the Atlanta Center was controlling them, but there was an economic interaction because they brought, they, they brought in their own interest also, they brought to their products, but at the same time, uh, differently from the case of Uruk and of Ubaid, in this case we uh, we have, I think, a kind of resistance to the integration. They did not want. They did not want. They did not. Probably they cannot integrate because they were very different societies with different interests, and uh, so there was a, a, a an interest in maintaining their own identity. This is why they brought to the palace their own pottery. They did not use it, the local pottery, they brought the red black pottery. So uh, it was a kind of uh, demonstration. They were other people and they wanted to be and to remain other people. And this lack of integration was in my opinion, the cause of what happened later. So. The Atlantepe Palace around 3200 BC was uh, burnt by a big fire and uh, was never, never reconstructed again. So this is the end of the system, not only the end of the palace, but the end of the system of the centralized system of Mesopotamian type. And from this time onward, the history of the site and of the entire area, because this is, is as an impact also in other sites and also in the in the um, LSIG region we have a different uh, a big change in this period um, because of the presence of this um, pastoralist or whatever these people that moving in the mountains came into contact with the expanding at that time expanding so-called Kurarax culture from the northeastern Anatolian Caucasus so the Caucasian people or these Kurorax people were interested in moving, uh, most of all in interacting with the Eastern Anatolian people. And so the pressure from these uh, new groups and the position of the local pastoralists that were interacting with both, with the, uh, with the early state center like Atlantepe and with the Kurorax, um, they were in some way absorbed by this Kurarax culture that was expanding. And um, I think that also the lack of urbanization at Atlantepe and in the whole site of uh, in Upper Euphrates uh, was also one of the reasons why these societies were unstable. They were weak weaker than in Mesopotamia because the city create an, a structural um, a structural, uh, solid uh, society uh, with strong relationship that cannot be overturned because they, the specialization, the specialization that creates the urban uh, society, the urban structure is something that creates also stability because people cannot change easily, at least. So, but in the case of Atlantepe, both the agricultural people, the rural people from the plain and the pastoralist people from the mountains re maintained, in my opinion, somehow their autonomy from the central power. So the central power pressed over them to obtain resources, to obtain work and labor, but they were not completely integrated. So 
this was also uh, one of the causes, I think, of this uh, collapse of this system and the history of uh, the entire region changed completely in early Bronze One. So from the end of fourth millennium BC and beginning of third millennium BC, um, the situation changed. And so we have the presence of uh, Kuroraks-like uh, groups, uh, both in the Altinova. Uh, you see here Noshun Tepe that has these houses with post hall that are very, very similar to the uh, Georgian uh, sites. Uh, the same pottery with very similar, also in the, the shape are similar, not only the technique. So the technique was adopted from central Anatolia. So it's the same technique of red black ware in this area because the Kurarax pottery in the early phases was not black, was brown, but not red black. So they, had, they connect, this is also another testimony, I think, another proof of the connection along the mountains of all these groups of mobile people. And at Atlantepe, where uh, we have the settlement on the ruins of the palace of a, of a pastoralist settlement with post halls, with uh, fences for the animals, and with red-black pottery, very, very similar to the Kurarax um, um, models and types. In the case of Atlantepe, we have found on the top of the mound, also very, this is also interesting, we found a big building, the only building made of mud bricks, um, that is quite big, with, was a kind of, uh, we can say public, in the sense that it's a place where probably people were received, where they, the, 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 the pastoralist chiefs, interacted with their population or with other people, uh, we don't know, in this area. We found that in this, in this room, a, a kind of storage area full of vessels. And there was a fence here separating the upper, the upper um, open area from uh, the, a unique isolated uh, hut bigger, larger than the others that I think was the, the chief hut. The pottery is completely black, except for few examples, like the ones you see there, that are only found in the public building, so in this communal building. So they're probably the result of the interaction with the local people from the plain. Uh, and it is clear the connection in the, at least in the technique and the, in the manufacture uh, and aesthetic uh, taste with the central and the previous so central Anatolian late Chalcolithic pottery. But now the shapes, the repertoire of shapes has changed. There are, uh, it's more uh, in the, in the case of the palace, they were mainly service pot. So they were um, cups, they were uh, jugs, they were uh, high stemmed bowls, uh, bowls. Um, but in the later period, in the in the village of the of the um, Kurorax like people, we we have uh, storage vessels, we have jars, we have all kind of vessels, of course, that are needed in the normal domestic life. And metallurgy again is very very similar to the previous one. So this is the, the confirmation that the metals were probably brought by the pastoralist also in the palace period. So they were the same kind of spearheads, the same kind and new uh, type of uh, jewelry uh, appear, this with the spiral, double spiral pin. And um, you see here the, the comparison between the 6A also in the silver inlay, the same, exactly the same technique, and also the composition. The composition is absolutely the same. So, and the connection with the Caucasian area, and with the uh, north central Anatolian area, with Wikistepe, for example. Uh, the analysis of metals show that the metal from for Atlant uh, of Atlantepe, so both in the 6A period, so in the late Chalcolithic five, and in the early Bronze one. Uh, comes from the north and northeast, so from different sources in the north of Anatolia, uh, and the same from the so-called royal tomb. I am going quickly because the time is going. 
um, where we have a lot of uh, jewelry, um, silver, some gold, and a lot of uh, um, arsenical copper. And the objects are very, very similar to the Caucasian objects, to the Kurorax uh, uh, period object from the Caucasus, Southern Caucasus. So you can see here the same diadems, the same spirals, the same um, weapons and the spearheads, axes, and so on, and also the same cyst grave, because the stone cyst grave is appeared for the first time in these regions, and uh, not only in Aslan Tepe, but also in other in other part of southeastern Anatolia. And the case of Bashuruyuk is the most famous now uh, because of the number of this cyst grave rich in metals. Uh, so the, the connection uh, of this area in the burial customs uh, um, also moved towards the, uh, the Euphrates, the middle Euphrates. So the, along the Euphrates Valley in Asekuyuk, we found similar objects, but also in the famous, now famous Birgic cemetery in the middle Euphrates. So the same object, the same cyst grave, the same burial custom. So they adopted a, a, a kind of uh, cultural and symbolic expression that was probably related with kind of rank societies that were the rank, the, the societies of the, these pastoralist groups that were hierarchical, but not in the same sense as the centralized state-like um, system of uh, Mesopotamia and of the, um, the previous period in Aslan Tepe. So these are comparison of, the, you see, the same objects in Bashur, in Asekuyuk, in Aslan Tepe, in all these regions. So there is a, a, new, a new synthesis, a new uh, koine of all this culture. And, um, but again, uh, the upper Mesopotamia proper remain separated in some way, the upper Euphrates and uh, has their own uh, identity and the uh, Kurorax also. So this, uh, the pottery from the royal tomb is very interesting because you see side by side in the same tomb, the connection between the um, old Mesopotamian tradition in pottery. So the, the reserved slip vessel, light colored and well made and the Kurorax like handmade red black pottery to put together in the same tomb. That means that these people were um, somehow conscious. They were um, in some way mixing uh, the two ethnic and cultural um, component. So uh, following this, we have in Atlantepe a proof of a, of a new change. So there is a big town wall on the top of the mound and the rural settlement outside the wall. So this means in my opinion, and we have proof of in the alternation of the, of the levels of the conflicts, probably conflicts for, for, from uh, between the rural component in the plain, so agriculturalist in the plain and pastoralist in the mountains that were contending the site. So there is a long period of instability in Atlantebe, but also in the region, I think, in the entire region. So this, this uh, relationship between pastoralist and agriculturalist, uh, Anatolian Kuro Araks and Mesopotamian tradition um, were, uh, all, were somehow mixing, but also conflicting because there were never been a real integration, as I told at the beginning, is not the same case of the, of the Ubaid or the Uruk uh, uh, phenomenon. It's a completely different uh, results. Um, and so, in fact, we have a, a new uh, development of a so-called post-Uruk culture along the Euphrates, upper and middle Euphrates. Now we have new links between Altinova, Atlantepe, and middle Euphrates. So all the area is connected again by this post-Uruk uh, production. So there are um, memory of the old time and they are um, uh, resuming this uh, tradition. Uh, just to conclude, I want to show you a completely different situation in the, so between what we have seen in the upper Euphrates, Atlanta Bay is the case, the more, 
most um, clear case. <clears throat> but in the middle of Euphrates, the situation is different because they did not receive the same impact from the Kururaks or from the pastoralist people. So we have a change in the burial customs. You have seen probably they adopted new system, new a new type of um, of uh, social uh, symbolic expression, but no real impact from. We have no red black wear. We have no indication of uh, post hole huts as in in the in the upper Euphrates. And what we have in the middle Euphrates sites, as Zaitili Bakche is an example, we have a incredible continuity. So the development from Uruk onwards is completely continuous with change, changes, of course, but slow changes, continuous change, and all, linking all the Euphrates Valley from north to south. You can see here how similar this pottery is, still early bronze tree. Uh, and in the middle Euphrates, we also have connection, still connection with Syro-Mesopotamia because we have the metallic ware, we have a, quite a lot of metallic ware in Zaytin Libakche and the other site in the area. And we have also ceilings, as you see, we found some in Zaytin Libakche with uh, seal designs that are close to the south, to the southern uh, Syro uh, Mesopotamian uh, region. So um, what we have uh, is a, it's a, kind of uh, border again between the north, so the upper Euphrates and the, the middle Euphrates. The middle Euphrates continued being linked to the south and to the Syro-Mesopotamian world. And the northern, uh, in the northern area, there is a complete break, a complete uh, change. And this is, is well expressed in the early bronze three sites of both uh, Malatya and Elazig region. I will show you now only as Lantepe, of course, because I have the material and because of the time, but uh, the same pottery, the same kind of settlements, the same kind of development development we have also in the uh, Altinova in the, in the Elazic region. So um, what we have in this period is a kind of provincial culture. So a new cultural area is established that is separated from the South and is not uh, so involved in the Northeastern Anatolian culture as before. So they have connection, of course, they are the result of this connection, but a, a new kind of uh, cultural province is created. It, it, this is interesting because uh, we also have in this period, a lot of sites that build uh, town walls. So there are uh, new kind of citadel, uh, probably conflicts among different sites. Um, so new political entities, completely different from before, more Anatolian in, in type with respect to the previous period. Um, and what we have now, it's a, it's a, a border. So what we have, it, Malatya Elazic province is something else from the Syro-Mesopotamian political ent entities from the central Anatolian and from the eastern Anatolia. But this created, in my opinion, prepared the, the way for what we have in the second millennium with the new relationship uh, of this uh, southeastern Anatolia with the um, central Anatolia during the Hittite, the formation of the Hittite king kingdom before and then the Hittite empire that expanded up to uh, Aslan Tepe and up to the upper Euphrates, um, where the site was a, a, a kind of frontier site between the, um, the Hittite and the Assyrian empire. So what we have in this period is the preparation uh, of new, new kind of political entities, new kind of uh, political landscape and new type of borders of, uh, of uh, between political borders, between different entities uh, that um, part the way for the creation of territorial states that are the characteristic of the empire period in the second millennium BC. Thank you very much. 
Professor Prangipani, thank you for this incredibly well demonstrated long term view of social and cultural change in Eastern Anatolia. Um, I um, um, would like to now uh, start the discussion. If you could use the reactions um, to raise hands, uh, we can go in order of uh, raising the hands, but as we wait for you to maybe collect your thoughts, I can propose a few questions to Professor Prangipani. Yeah, yes. okay, there is there is a question already. Okay. Um, yes, Manar Hamad, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have appreciated the presentation. Um, my question would be about the clay of pottery. You said that in the first periods that you were interested in, the clay was always local. Then in the palace, you signaled that there are two, uh, the, the royal tombs. There are two groups of potteries with different forms signaling two different influences. <clears throat> in this case, is the clay local with foreign forms or is the clay coming from elsewhere? Thank you for your question, very, very important. Uh, so yes, they are local because we made uh, not from, uh, not exactly from, from the pots from the Royal tomb because they were entire pots that were brought to the museum and we, we couldn't analyze, but we analyzed similar pots from the same period. And um, uh, the result is very interesting because the red black <coughs> were, used people people manufacturing the red black ware used different sources but from the same malatya region so we have uh, for the they used for black red black ware some clay sources from the south um, of the of the malatya area and from for the wheel made pottery from another source, but from the Malatya area. So <laughs> they are not import, they are different people. This is why we think, and also Giulio Palumbi, who has worked on these materials, has also stated, and I agree completely with him, <coughs> that uh, these people coming to Atlantepe were not coming from the Georgia or from uh, Armenia or from the Kurarax regions, <laughs> but they were local people, local pastoralists moving in the mountains and being part of the so-called Kurarax family. But they were, so this is, of course, this entailed the problem of what is Kurarax. <laughs> it's not one single uh, people, one single political entity, <laughs> but it's a cultural world and of people living in the same way, having the same similar patterns of uh, subsistence economy. Uh, in my opinion, strongly based on pastoralism, not only of course, but very strongly based also on pastoralism. And uh, so these people were different people, but living in the area, not coming from far away. Um, may I ask another question? Yes. Um, you made a position between the clays that are local and the metals that are not local. Are these the two main materials you are interested in or are there uh, something else? For instance, you spoke about wool possibly and you did not expand. Is wool local or the wool comes from elsewhere? Of course, we don't have wool preserved, so we don't know. We couldn't make. A, I think I. I suppose I make just an hypothesis that wool was also another another product brought by the pastoralists because usually, it's a it's a important for textile production. But what we have for textile production in Atlantepe are indirect proofs. So we have uh, spindle walls that have been studied by some component of our team. 
that show that there were two different or three different types of spindle war, wars that are uh, suitable for different kinds of textile. So for example, according to the weight, according to the size, according to the material. So we have spindle walls made of stone, spindle walls made of bone, of different size and so on. And so what these um, colleagues have shown, this, this is published, if you want, I can send you the publication. Um, some of these uh, spindle walls were probably used for wool because of the characteristic of the spindle world with respect to the kind of textile. Uh, but, but we don't have wool directly, so preserve it. So we cannot say. Yes, uh, one last question, if you allow me. Did you find kilns or uh, places to work metal, fireplaces, I mean, fire traces? Okay, so um, this is, uh, this is a, again a very, very interesting question. We don't have find, uh, we don't found um, um, fi um, oven or fireplaces, big fireplaces, but we have a very interesting uh, metallurgical uh, activity area in early bronze one, in the settlement, uh, the, what I showed you, the rural people settlement after the palace collapsed. In the palace period, we don't have, because we only have the palace. We don't have found uh, yet the area, the activity area or the normal house area, so we don't know. But in the later period, in early bronze one, so if the settlement is between 3000 and 2800 BC, we found a courtyard where um, there there were um, a kind. There was first there was a pit with a very with a fire fire that was uh, at a very high temperature. So they um, this fired the the earth around, and close to this fireplace we found uh, some small pieces of minerals, crushed mineral pieces, copper mineral, and 10 big stone pestle that were used. We made the trail traces and uh, wear traces analysis, and they were used to crush metal. So in this area, and, and we found also in the same courtyard, uh, both on the, on the floor, and under the floor, so reuse it to pave the floor, hundreds of uh, slag, copper slag. So this area was used to produce copper uh, in a way that is not, they did not use oven, they did not use very sophisticated uh, um, uh, tools. But we also made experiments, Alberto Palmieri made experiments of this, and um, we saw that uh, in, also in the experiment that it's very easy to reach 1,200 degree of temperature just by inflating into the, the fire um, with, a, with a tool like a tuyere or something like that. So, um, so they could do this uh, directly in an open area. Uh, what is interesting is that in the later period, so in early bronze three, we found in a house a lot of uh, uh, mold for metal objects and crucibles, small crucibles, to pour the, the metal into the, the, the mold, mold uh, but not slag, not mineral, nothing, nothing of this. So what I think is that the metallurgy had uh, different steps. Uh, in the early phase, the, the quantity of the product of the metal produced was not so, so high, so big, as to create a specialized, a differentiated activity among different artisans. So they made all at house, we can say, at home. But in later period, when probably the, the, the type of object, the, the variety of objects, the number of objects made in metal were much, much uh, numerous. 
So they probably started to produce to the smelting in the mine areas or outside the site, and then they melted the ingots in the site. So it's a proof of a probably of a change in the organization of metal production. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Further questions? If um, you could raise, there is one question in the chat box. And um, if I were to interpret it for you, it is asking, um, how could we tell apart, you know, these town, uh, town walls? Are, um, are they really defensive in purpose? Or uh, do, could they have a different purpose, like a commercial purpose to ensure that the entrance to the town with commodities would pay their tax? So that's the question. Yeah. Well, uh, we have two, well, three types of, uh, or three periods with town walls. One is the first town wall we have found in the early bronze one uh, that is on the top of the mound. It's a kind of citadel wall, but not it is not surrounding the entire settlement, but just a small part on the top. And unfortunately, we don't know what uh, there was in this upper part because uh, we have a, a kind of open space, a kind of square, open open area, but. Um, uh, we couldn't see it for for very large uh, parts because in the northern part, all this uh, level was destroyed by the Hittite settlement. So it is not preserved. So we only have the wall, uh, some rooms along the wall, an entrance, and an open space. But we don't know which was the function. In the later period, so in early bronze three, the last uh, town wall I showed, uh, and this uh, and where the, in this case the town wall were around the, the entire town, and they were the, uh, also spread not only in Aznantepe, in many sites. We have town walls in in the sites in the Altinova. We have town walls in the Malatya region in, very, in many place, many places. I think they were defense wall. I think there must have been conflict among the different uh, towns emerging from this period of instability and trying to, to get to power again. Yes, thank you. Um, my question <laughs> uh, would be about um, a general comparison between um, Central Anatolia and East Anatolia. We, you know, we have these sites that show similar characteristics from maybe the fifth millennium onwards or later sixth millennium, like Buvergin Kayasu, Jan Hassan, but then there's a different trajectory for um, the central Anatolian or even uh, the Aegean coast uh, in comparison to the East Anatolian developments state toward um, state or more hierarchical societies, emergence of centralization, let's say. Uh, uh, would you be able to comment on that a little bit in terms of the comparisons? You know, what, what is different here? What, what, you know, why don't we see similar um, developments in central Anatolia, you would think? Yes. Uh, so um, you are right. So these sites are again are also, of course, uh, uh, beginning a, a, a pathway towards complexity, toward more elaborated uh, social uh, organization. But they are very different from East Anatolia, as you said. And I think that the reason is in the previous Neolithic uh, society organization. So the Neolithic in the central Anatolia, for example, Chataluyuk or the most famous sites or other sites in the, in the area uh, is very different from the Neolithic of uh, the Hasuna or Alaf period or uh, even more from the, of course, Samara and Obeid uh, societies. So these are more, mm, mm, in, at least it's, it's my opinion, maybe I don't know if everybody agree with this, but I think they are more um, domestic based societies. So the family are the, the core 
of the society development, even if they are uh, agglutinated settlements, so they are organized. But if you look at this settlement, you don't see central power, you don't see central management, you don't see central storage. The storage is in the house. The activities are in the houses. Mm -hmm. While in the East, it, the community uh, level is much more important. And so then gave rise to different kinds of developments. Mm. This is my explanation. I don't mm. know if mm. it's correct. Yeah. Um, the other question is um, uh, what, you know, we are talking about these movements of people, movements of ideas, in you know, depending on the period we have, th there are different highlights, different processes going on in uh, the uh, spread of similar traditions, cultural material, and things like that. Um, how far, uh, what's our knowledge on the archaeogenomic uh, or DNA evidence uh, on this front? Well, uh, this is a, a very big question because, <laughs> as you know, um, at least I believe that the results we have from DNA up to now are very interesting, but are not enough. Mm. We need much, much more samples mm. to, to, to have a picture, a wide mm. general picture. So we see, for example, that there are some continuity in the genomic history of the population of uh, Southeastern Anatolia. Mm -hmm. We made also um, a project, we are still doing a project on DNA, but I am not completely satisfied in the sense that, of course they are correct, so, but why? So uh, this similarity uh, depends on the similar origins in the Neolithic, in the Fertile Crescent, in the because they said, for example, in Atlantepe, they found a um, Iranian um, mm. Caucasian Iranian group. What does it mean? So that mm. these people mixed at one point, or that they come from the same origin of Neolithic people mm. during the Neolithic Revolution. So we don't know. So we, I think, we need much, much more sample to be analyzed to be really confident on mm. the results. Mm. Absolutely. Um, there's one more question from Camille Curin. Um, she is uh, posing the question about the cylinder seals in Aslantepe. Are they of local fabrication or are they from the Uruk cities, colonies or the core in South Mesopotamia? And, in, and she's extending the question, if they are from Mesopotamia, uh, could they be proof of direct exchanges with the Uruk core? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we don't have seals. We, we only have seal impressions. Uh, we have uh, just very few, very, very few seals that are stamp seals. No cylinder seal from this period. We have the impression of the seal. Of the seal. Uh, so uh, we cannot say about nothing about the material or the provenance of the material, but the style of these ceilings are, in my opinion, but also Holly Pittman said the same. So they are emulating some iconographies of Mesopotamian origin, but they are not the same. They are not properly Mesopotamian. They have a local style. So I, I don't think they come from Mesopotamia. Mm. Um, any more questions for Professor Prangipani? We have been keeping her for such a long period of time and um, we have been receiving in the chat box many thanks for this wonderful and illuminating talk. Thank uh, you, this, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And this talk is going to be, it, uh, uh, on uh, Arva's YouTube channel uh, very shortly. Mm -hmm. It's been recorded. So uh, we thank Marcella Frangipani again for thank this wonderful you. talk uh, and thank your you. time. Thank, thank you. Thank you to you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. It is always a pleasure to speak with uh, colleagues, uh, especially in, uh, Turkish colleagues. It's my, my pleasure. Thank really. you very much. Thank you very much. and. Um, we will be in touch with you for further events soon. So yeah. have a good evening for the moment. Thank
Thank you. And to you too. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.